we fall, you will not forsake us, you will not forsake us, because you are King and Lord of all, Lord of all, we give thanks, we give thanks, yes Lord, we give you praise, oh God, yes God, for we know that all things work together for our good. We give praise. Come on, church. We give praise. For by faith we know your grace will see us through. We give thanks, O oh Lord. We give thanks. We give praise. things work together for our good we give thanks yes, lord we give you praise oh lord we give you praise for by faith we know your grace will see us through for by faith we know your grace will see Yes, Father, thank you, God, for this opportunity, Lord, this privilege, God, to know you, Lord, more by faith, God. Yun po yung gusto nyong gawin namin, Lord, makilala namin kayo nilubos sa patuloy namin paglakad na nananampalataya sa iyo. Kaya mo ngayong umaga, patuloy kaming mamula, ma, makita namin yung katotohanan at patuloy namin ilakad, Lord. Yung bawat mensahe na gusto niyong ituro sa amin ngayong umaga. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, sa napakagandang araw na to at sa pagkakataon na, na patuloy kaming matuto. Lord, patuloy kang kumilos sa aming kalagitan. Patuloy namin binabalik sa iyo kapuryan. We thank you, God. We honor you. We love you, God. In His name we pray. Amen. Amen. We may all be seated. As you sit down, I want you to get settled in. Um, Can I, can I ask you guys, um, while these guys are playing, um, you know, all of us are called to do something by God. When you came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, the operations of His will started to fully happen into your life. And the more you become sensitive to the Holy Spirit, the more He reveals more stuff to you, and then the more obedient you are, To the Holy Spirit, the more He reveals stuff to you. And, and even in your hard times, in your tragedies, in your victories, in your triumphs, as you follow God, He begins to reveal stuff to you all the time. And the next level, you know, happens on this level. And so, with where we are today, and wherever you are today, can I ask you to not, right now, think of what the next level is. You know, okay, ano kaya? What's next for me? What's next for me? Can I just lead you into a prayer today? Which is a small moment, but I'm not going to pray. Can I just ask you to bow your head with me for a second? And I just want you to say this prayer. It's, it's, it's three words long, but can be very intense for you this whole day today. Okay? Tatlong words lang. Pero sobrang intense ito to you. Because if God has called you, and He has for your family, for your own spiritual life, for your business, for your job, and to my fellow pastors and workers, for our personal ministry, can I just ask you to say this prayer in your heart? Say, Lord Jesus, show me something. That's it. Three words. Show me something. Pakitaan mo ako, Panginoon. Hindi magpakita ang Panginoon. Hindi natin kaya yun. Pakitaan mo ako, Panginoon. Ngayong araw na to. Because I believe God has called all of us to be here today. In one way, shape, or form. And if you're watching us live on stream, I want you to see that today. Okay? Don't ask the Lord, show me something based on what my neighbor says. Or what the other guy is doing. Or what the other church is doing. Or what this other person is doing. But ask God to show you Something. 
about what he wants you to do. Okay? Because that's what you're supposed to take care of today. What God's given you. Okay? Lord, show me something. Pakitaan mo ako, Panginoon. Pakitaan mo po ako, Panginoon. Okay? Lord Jesus, show us something today. We understand you work corporately, but before you can work corporately, you work individually, privately, in our hearts and minds as we begin to write your principles down. Lord, show us something. Reveal to us if we are doing wrong. Expose the wrongs of our life. Make us humble to receive them. But most of all, show us what steps to take next. How to take care of them. How to keep them for today. Please do that. In your name we pray. Amen. So happy this morning that um, uh, Pastor Wayne is here. Now you know in other circles he's called Dr. Wayne. He's called Dr. Wayne Young. Uh, you know we've had Pope visits recently here. So this is the Pope of Jacksonville. I've been teasing him about that. You know, we're happy that the Pope of Jacksonville has decided to visit us today. This is not really a visit for him. This is his home on this side of the world. If you notice uh, on our Facebook page, he saw the picture of us with the staff, except it's only his head because he complained we, we couldn't place him anywhere. Uh, but I'm, I'm so happy uh, that he's here uh, and to share with us here. I think Pastor... Um, Probably of all the seminars you have done and teachings that you've done in our ministry here, this is the most widely um, spread out with regards to the people that are here. Here we have people today who are business folk. We have, of course, pastors and people in training and seminary um, to, to uh, parents and on all that. And all of them are important to everything that we're going to learn today. So I want you to do two things throughout this day. Other than asking the Lord what he wants you to know. But I also want to ask you to pray for Pastor Wayne. Because um, he's got an incredibly busy schedule this visit around. Not only uh, ministerially, but also structurally for, for his group and his organization. So, so you know, um, uh, pray for him and his safety. In fact, he'll be preaching here. Uh, on Sunday morning and then Sunday afternoon, he's driving to Tarlac, right? And then, so if you have uh, pastor friends in Tarlac, he's doing a seminar there in the, at the Nick Hotel, right? Right. Uh, there on Monday and Tuesday. And then from Tarlac, he's going to Baguio at the Supreme Hotel, right? At the Supreme Hotel for another two days. And that would be, I assume, Wednesday and Thursday? Wednesday and Thursday. So if you have uh, friends or family there at the Supreme Hotel, um, go there. Or if you want to follow him around and troll Pastor Wayne around, you know, you could do that also. But they're driving there. So it's quite a drive. Uh, pray for them and, and this ministry and the ministry that they're, the Lord's leading them to. Uh, pray that uh, the Lord will continue to open more doors for him to be able to do that. Okay. Uh, but today he's home uh, with us. And so we're happy that he's here. So join us, and I know you're excited, so I'm going to set him loose and let him go. And uh, I want you to, uh, later in the afternoon, by the way, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to contribute to his ministry. Uh, and that means that we're going to take an offering for his ministry to, to be able to continue to do that, to invest in his ministry as well. Um, as you all know, I don't believe that, you know, when he first did this along many years ago, he did everything for free. In fact, those books, basically, he's giving it to you guys. I told him, Pastor Wayne, I don't believe that. So <laughs> let us give, it's not going to cover everything, but we want as a show of gesture to you to be a part of that. So I want you to be prepared for an offering um, at the onset of the, of the afternoon. Okay, this builds up to the other, so please don't, don't miss on, on the seminars for this whole day. Okay, all right, good. Uh, and again, I welcome him uh, home, uh, people of IBC, Pastor Wayne. Can, can you put the last song we were singing back up on the screen, please?
going over to even if I fail? Even if we stumble, even if we fall, you will not forsake us. You are king and Lord of all. We sing songs often, and we don't pay attention to the words. Pastor James said, pray this prayer, show me something. And that had already happened to me just with that verse. Because the enemy of my soul tried to bring condemnation in my life last night. And I struggled and prayed and God, you know, I'm sorry, forgive me, all the stuff. And it wasn't until this morning, a principle that I know to be true, that I preach, I teach, I've walked in, was reminded to me. And at that moment, I fell to my knees saying, Lord, you're always right. You're always right. And thank you that you never forsake me. Even when the enemy has a plan to destroy me, you always, always are present with me. What's he going to show you today? I'm going to talk to you today about some things. And I'm going to... Is there anybody here that's not heard me preach before? Anybody here? This is your first time. Okay. So we don't need to introduce any of that. I'm going to talk to you today, and I'm going to challenge you about some things regarding gates. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I'm going to lead with this. Because you can't be a gatekeeper until you understand this. It's the Psalm of David. And it's the Psalm of David that's so familiar to you, most everyone in this room can quote it, if in Tagalog or you can quote it in English. Because one of the first things you learn, it's one of the things we, we, we say to our children, it's one of the things that you first hear as a child even because when you first hear it you always hear it at a funeral anybody know what that psalm is remember we're in class today we we ask questions and we answer it's psalms 23 do you you know what it says psalm 23 how many of you know psalm 23 come on raise your hand you know psalm 23 the lord is my shepherd I shall excuse me what I shall not want see the problem is we forget not the Lord is my shepherd I want how'd you pray this morning Lord give me this Lord do this for me Lord move me here Lord Are you following me? How did you pray this morning? Did you pray wanting? Or did you pray dying? See, Jesus in the garden prayed, If it's your will, let this cup pass from me. When you watch the model prayer, everything about the model prayer was all about the Father in John 17. It's all about the Father or someone else. It's not about giving me anything. Hello. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now watch this. What's the next part of that? He maketh me in green. Then how come you we always are looking to be somewhere else. We're always looking to be in another place in ministry, that next level. When Pastor James said that, I'm going, yes! Because I knew I was going to open with this, though it's not in the notes. It's important for an understanding because until you grasp this principle, you cannot truly be a gatekeeper. See, you have an assignment. You have an assignment from the moment you are born again. You have an assignment. 
and God places you where you need to be. He maketh me. He doesn't let me choose. He maketh me. We choose, it becomes what I want, not what he said. To lie down in green pastures. We're always looking for the better place. The better ministry, the better job, the better husband, the better wife, the better children, the better parents. We always want the better. And yet God says, where I place you is the best place for you. Because you can lay down there. Do you know what happens to your body when you sleep? Healing and growth occurs. Sleep is essential for healing and growth. And look at this. God says, I maketh you to lie down, to rest in the green pasture. Where I have placed you allows you to be healthy, whole, healed, delivered, allows you to be functional, and it gives you everything you need. So why do we just read that psalm at a funeral? When it's not at all about death, it's about the living being led by the Spirit of God. Hello. Because it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, guess what? The dead are already dead. They're not in the shadow of death. They're already there. The the psalm is not for the dead. It's for us who are alive and remain. And we have an assignment to be gatekeepers. And until we understand, we need to quit looking at the next place and be the keeper of the place he has us. We cannot be successful in life. Don't care how much money you make. Don't care how many children you have. I don't care how many, how big your church is, how many people there are. None of that matters to me. I don't care how many businesses you own. None of that matters to me. None of that matters in the kingdom of God for success. What matters for success in the kingdom of God is when you have done the will of the Father where he has placed you. Amen? Does that make sense to you? Am I going too fast or do you understand my English clearly? It's okay? So when we talk about this, and as we're going to talk about gatekeepers today, it's important that we understand that God has created us to be a people that will impact our community, impact the lives that we touch. It's going to do that. I, it's not a sign yet. I'll, I, it'll get there in a minute. But, but the impact... So I, I'm just, I just want you to understand, we are called, I, I make this statement, you can write it down, it's not in your notes, but I wrote this, it says, we are called to impact or to be agents of transformation. We are called to impact or to be agents of transformation. We are not just to sit and wait for Christ's return. We are not just to sit and wait for Christ's return. That's every child of God, everyone who's born again, everyone who has trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. From the youngest to the oldest, we are not to sit and wait for Christ's return. We are to be agents of transformation. We are to impact our communities. Our sphere of influence. The area where we have influence. The pasture where we have been placed. If you have been placed in a business and you're a business leader, you are to have impact and bring about transformation in that place of business. Well, I don't own the business. Okay. You can still impact the people you're around. God has placed you in that pasture as his agent, his missionary, if you will, to accomplish his work, to guard the gate of the kingdom of God in that place. 
Are you with me? Every believer is called to action. Every believer is called to action. I wrote it this way. I believe it is the responsibility of the church, a responsibility of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll get you one. Can you bring me a book, please? Can you bring me a book, please? I believe it is the responsibility of the church to be a church that will impact our community's transformation by loving God and loving people. We are to be a church that will impact our community's transformation, our spheres of influence, by loving God and loving people. Now, there's something you must understand. Loving God, loving people. You see it on churches. I've seen it on banners in churches throughout the United States, throughout the Philippines where I've traveled. Love God, love people. The problem is we don't fully understand love God and love people. Because everybody that has that up says this. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and might, and your neighbor as yourself. Except that's not for today. All my theologians in here, I got any professors in here just went, oh no. No. That was written under the law that Jesus fulfilled. We live and walk in grace at the moment. We're going to talk more about loving God and loving people. I'm going to show you what that means. Because to be a gatekeeper, we must love God according to Scripture. We must love people according to Scripture. We love God according to the covenant, and we love people according to His covenant. A new covenant. The loving God under the new covenant has never changed. Loving God, people under the new covenant did change. Because it says this in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm just going to go ahead and go there. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Be imitators of God as His dear children. It goes on in verse 2 and it tells us this, that we are to love one another. We are to manifest that. As a matter of fact, it's not in the, in the PowerPoint. As a matter of fact, the, the message translation says this of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. It was not designed to get anything from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. See, the problem is, if we love our neighbors as we love ourselves, it's selfish. Hello? If we love our neighbors as we love ourselves, we protect ourselves in love. We protect ourselves that we don't get hurt. But when we love as Christ loved, it's extravagant. It's costly. And so Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I love you, not as you love yourself. Love like that. To be a gatekeeper, you must learn to love like that. We'll talk some more about that in a moment. It's in your notes, and we'll get there in a second. So why do we need to be gatekeepers? What's important? What does it mean by gates? What is it to deal with a, a, a gate, gatekeepers? Most of us have never, ever heard a um, message about gates in the Bible. In the seminary classes I've taken, we looked at gates, we did that, but there was no emphasis on the gates and the importance of it. Except when they tried to tie the gates to Christ's return. 
But gates are important. So we need to take a moment and figure out what do gates mean. And I don't remember if I have the whole definition in there in the notes for you from Nelson's Bible Dictionary. Is that there? In Nelson's Bible Dictionary, it's a massive wooden door or city wall through which traffic passed. It's reinforced with brass and iron. These gates were open during the day to allow the citizens to come and go, but they were generally closed at night as a safety measure. Can, can I tell you something? In the Philippines, you should understand gates better than the people in the states. Because in the states, most houses do not have gates at their doors. But everywhere you are here, there's a gate. There's gates at the church. I, I come through gates to get into here. I go through gates to get in hotels sometimes. I go through gates to get in places. Gates are everywhere in this nation. Why? Because they represent something. And there's a responsibility when it comes to a gate. In the Bible, in the gate, at the gate, in the Bible, at the gate, watch this. Important legal matters were discussed. It was a central location, it was easily noted. In the Bible, gates represent symbols of power and authority. You need to write that down. In the Bible, gates represent symbols of power and authority. In your home, at this church, everywhere you have a gate, it represents power, authority. If you don't have the power, the key to open the gate, you can't come in. Hello? You have to have the key to the gate to open the gate, yes? yes? Or somebody that has the power, listen to me, somebody that has the power and the authority will open the gate for you. Somebody that has the power and the authority will open the gate for you. Gates tie back to what Jesus said about binding and loosening, and he says this, I have given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I've given you the authority, the ability to open and close the gates for the kingdom of God. Ooh, hello. Many times we try to make it really big about sound really, as pastors, we, we want to sound very smart and, and make it sound really big about the keys to the kingdom of heaven or this and this and this. No, the Bible, it ties back to binding and loosening. Closing and opening the gate. That's all it means. The spiritual gates in your area are opened and closed by you because you represent the kingdom of heaven in your, watch this, pasture. Hello. Hello. Can I tell you something? Every child of God has the keys to their gate. The authority, remember? It's the authority, the power to open and close the gate. Jesus said this in John chapter 1 and verse 12. To as many as believe on my name, to them gave he, the Father gave them the power, the power to become the sons of God. That word power is exousia. Exousia. And it means the right, the privilege, the authority. God gave every one who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ the keys, the authority to open and close the gates. Hello? See, we don't talk about gates very much because we didn't see their significance. 
legal matters were settled in the gates. Gates in, in, Eastern, in, in Eastern cultures, which you guys are, anciently they, they held an important part. They were defense. They were a place of economy. They were a place of public resort. There were places of deliberation. As a matter of fact, you can find these things in, in the Bible. Watch this. About places of deliberation, or in other words, the administration of judgment, or the audience for kings, or rulers, or ambassadors. In the gates, all of that took place. And all of that can be found, and I think it's in your notes, can be found in Deuteronomy 16, Deuteronomy 21, Deuteronomy 25, Joshua 20, Judges 9. And that's just a few of the places in Scripture that refer to the judgments in the gates, the places of deliberation in the gates. There were a place where goods were bought and sold. How many of you are here are business people? You own a business or you're a manager of a business? Anybody here business, business people? Yes, no? Do you understand my English? How many of you are in management in some sort of business? Anybody? Pastor James is. He's a management business. Watch this. Watch this. In the business that you have, the Bible refers to the businesses you have as gates. It's a gateway. It's a gateway. So write this down. This should be in your notes. Gateways represent, gates represent a pathway to safety. A pathway to safety. You remember the passage of scripture where it talks about running into the presence of God, the gate, you run into that place, it's a place of safety. Gates were a place of meeting. Anytime you hear gates talked about in scripture, when it has to do with the end times, it talks about, we used to sing an old southern gospel song in the States called, Just Inside the Eastern Gate. And it's all about Jesus coming back, and it's referred to meeting at the gate. Gates are a place of meeting, a place of safety, a place of meeting. IBC is a gate. It's a place of meeting. Gates are a place of commerce. Business is conducted in the gates. It's a place for court. Court was held in the gates. Gates were a place of influence. How many of you, watch this, a place of influence. How many of you go past a home here in the Philippines, you've rode past it, and you make a judgment about the home because of the gate on the outside of the home? Come on, is that right? Try to go to Corinthians down here in the, villa, uh, in the gate. You make a judgment based on what the gate looks like. Is that correct? That means gates influence. The way the gate looks influences people's perception. You're a gate and you influence people's perception about the kingdom of God by the way you stand in the gate. Amen. Gate was a place of governing. The elders of the city, the rulers of the city, met and governed the city by the gates. All of those things are natural. 
But what's true of the natural is even more true in the spiritual. We live in a body. We have a soul. But the spirit realm that we influence is much greater than what we see in our natural. What you do not see in the spirit realm is much greater than what you see in the natural. The influence that you have as a gate in the spirit realm is much greater than the influence you have in the natural. You say, I'm just a cashier at the store. Your gate. And you may not have much influence except right there in the natural. But in the spirit realm, God has placed you in a place to carry forth his influence in areas you cannot see. Gates are extremely important. I asked the question, why gatekeepers? Why is it important to talk about gatekeepers? What's the, the, the thing that's so important about gatekeepers? Because the body of Christ has failed miserably in their job. God the Father said this. My children will possess the gates of their enemies. My children shall possess the gates of their enemies. Genesis chapter 22. Beginning with verse 15. Reading from the New American Standard today. It says this, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham, that's a pre-incarnate Christ, calls to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and you have not withheld your son. In other words, watch, look at me. Because Abraham was willing to die to his own desire, because he was willing to die to his want. Because he was willing to die to what he thought was best. Because he understood before it was written, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Because he was willing to go where God had placed him, God calls out to him. At that moment of obedience. And said this. Because you have done this and not withheld your son. Your only son. I Indeed I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed. As the stars of the heavens. And the sand which is on the seashore. Now watch. Watch. Look at me. Everybody I know for the most part quotes this passage when it talks about the children of Israel and it says their, their seed, Abraham's seed, will outnumber the stars of the sky, the sands of the seashore, and anybody who blesses Israel, watch, will be blessed. How many times have you heard that statement? We bless Israel, and when we bless Israel, the nation, the children of God, the national children of God, then we will be blessed. But we skip a very important phrase. The promise of God says that I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gates. Of their enemies. And all your seed. And all the nation of the earth. Shall be blessed. Because you obeyed me. Your seed. Shall possess. The gates. Of their enemies. I've said this before. Most of you have probably heard it. I went to church before I was born. 
the nine months I was in my mother's womb, I was going to church. I grew up in church. I've always been in church. And I'm telling you, in all the years, I'm in my 50s. And until I preach the message about gates to the church that I pastor, I had never one time in all those years, in over four decades, I had never heard a message preached on gates. You know what the name of my church is? West Gate Church. Do you know why? Because we're in the west side of our city. We sit on a major thoroughfare in our city called Interstate 10. That's where God placed us. And we are the gate, the gateway. We believe in the spirit, spirit realm. We are to be a place of safety, of refuge. We believe that we're to be a place that influences the government, a place of influence. We believe that our church is to be a place that influences the commerce in our city. We believe that our city, our, our place should be a place that people could come to and they could meet at. We believe that justice should be served as a result of our church and how we live. That's how we got our name. We didn't just pick the name Westgate because it sounded good. Pastor Paul was talking to me yesterday, I guess it was, from back in July when I was here and did a, a class for the seminary students, a week-long seminar class. And I said something to them then. I said, if you cannot name it, you cannot manage it. If you don't name it properly, you can't manage it. Names are important. That's why Westgate is named what it's named. A name's important. I love the fact that this is IBC International Bible Church. You name it, you can manage it. It's all about the Bible, the Word at work. That thrills my soul. It's Foundation Week. I agree with the great foundation has been laid in this place. A great foundation has been laid. There's great truth and great understanding that was laid through International Bible. Are you following me? I, I, International Baptist. I get it. It's a great foundation. Don't change your foundation. But the reality is it's Bible. It's about the Bible, not about the religion. Hello? Hello? It's about the Bible. You can manage that. I don't need to manage the religion. God's not in the religion. He's in the relationship. And the relationship's the Bible because in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Bible is Christ in today in us. Are you following me? I love the fact the name's important. We're named Westgate for a reason. We want to be a people of influence. We've done a poor job as pastors of expressing to you the importance of gates in the kingdom of God. I said earlier, I stand on it, I believe it. It is our responsibility to be a church that will impact our community's transformation by loving God and loving people. I started down this path. Matthew says this, verse, chapter 22, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. I said earlier, I'm going to say it again because you have a years and years and years of love your neighbor as love yourself. That's one of the first verses I remember 
learning as a child in Sunday school. Love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and might. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. My Sunday school teachers used to teach me. Share, Wayne. Share with your friends. Don't play with all the toys. Share with your friends. Love your neighbor. You love those toys. You love your neighbor like you love yourself. You let them play with your toys. Hello? My Sunday school teachers taught me that commandment. But they didn't understand when Jesus in John chapter 13, in John chapter 13, when Jesus says, John 13, 34, he says, look, I'm dying. I'm leaving. I'm going to a place. My time on earth has come. I'm at the end of my road. He's sitting at the last supper. He's there. This is the last dinner conversation he's going to have before he goes to the cross. And he's sitting in that place. And he says to his disciples, listen to me. Behold, I give you a new commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Disciples, you heard me say to the Pharisees, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and might. It's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like to it, love your neighbor as yourself. You heard me teach that. You heard me say that. That's what you grew up on. But behold, today I give you a new commandment. By the way, that was after he said to them, this is the new covenant of my blood. Take and drink. Hello? He had said there's a new covenant. That's the old covenant. There's a new covenant. The new covenant, love God, but you love people as I have loved you. My love is not cautious, Ephesians chapter two, or 5, verse 2 Message translation, my love is not cautious, but extravagant. Not designed to get anything from you, to give everything of myself to you, love like that. If you are truly going to inhabit the gates of your enemies, if you're truly going to influence, if you're truly going to embrace your call as a gatekeeper, you must love extravagantly like Christ did. Which is a love marked by giving and not getting. Sunday morning I'll be preaching here. On Sunday morning I'll be preaching around this statement. You cannot complete your assignment through casual living and charitable giving. On Sunday morning I'll be preaching. You cannot complete your assignment through casual living and charitable giving. You cannot love God and love people casually. Hello. It's very quiet in here today. You're not talking much to me. I I'm wondering if you understand what I'm saying. You just wish I'd quit saying it, right? So let's put this together. For all of you scholars out there, I'm not being, there's no blasphemy here. The word is the word is the word. Would you agree the word's the word? So I just want to illustrate something to you. So if we're truly going to be gatekeepers, and we're going to bring about an impact to our community's transformation, the change of our community, the change of our spheres of influence, then we're going to do that through loving God and loving people. So why don't we learn it this way? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So when I say love God, love people, I mean love God, 
but love people as Christ loved them. Not selfish like you love yourself, but selfless like Christ loved us. Amen? Do you understand that? So if, watch this, so if we can grasp that portion, if we can grasp to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, for this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second one is equally important, love each other just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world you are my disciples. If that's the case, let me ask you a question. What part of loving God and loving people is passive or casual? What part of loving God and loving people is passive or just casual? Every part of it is action. Every part of it is active. Every part of it is alive. Every part of it requires you to do something. Watch this. Because you, this is not proper, at the Florence principle, extraordinaire, this is not proper grammar. Okay? So don't, don't, don't critique me on it. It's not proper grammar. Any of you other school teachers in here? I'm looking at you, Claire. At the Claire, I'm looking at you. All you school teachers in here, don't critique me on the grammar. But if you be a child of God, you've been given the right to privilege the authority. When you be a child of God, you will do the work of God. Not, not good grammar, but great truth. When you be the child of God. You don't have to do... My son Jared, who will be 16 in two weeks, who's as tall as I am, big as I am, wears shoes bigger than mine, at be 16 in two weeks. He didn't have to do anything to be a young he just is but as a result of being a young my child there's certain things he will do for example he lives in my house and as long as he lives under my roof he will go to church period he can't do anything to be my son he just is my son but as a result of being my child, he will do certain things. As a result, to as many as believe on his name, to them gave he the right, the power, the privilege, the exousia to become the sons of God. As a result of being a child of God, you will do certain things. The problem is, we're just like many children today as the body of Christ. We're very casual in our life. Hello. And the reason when we're casual, we leave the gates open. When we're casual in our life, we don't guard the gates. The gates are left open. Let's continue to talk about things you'll do. Watch. Watch what happens here. I said there's nothing about loving God and loving people that is passive or casual. It is a call to action. And that call to action is best seen because Jesus modeled it for us before he said, love like I love. Before he said, love like I love, you go back to John chapter 13. Go back and pick up in verse 12 and it says this. Watch. After washing their feet, 
he put his robe on again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. If you're going to make an impact, you have to love as Christ loved. I'm developing, I haven't had a chance to talk to Pastor James about this. Hopefully I'll get a chance. I'm developing a whole new message series dealing with the restoration of honor in the body of Christ. You in the Eastern culture understand this even better than I do. You don't realize it, but you understand it because it's built in with you. When I first started coming to the Philippines, it was very prominent all the time. Somebody would come through or get up, and they'd go, sorry, sorry. Now sometimes they just do this. It's not as much as, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's a, you almost feel less than when you walk past somebody or you interrupt somebody. That shame. Oh, I'm shamed that I, I bothered you. I'm shamed that I, can I tell you something? This is free. It's not in your notes. This is still percolating inside. There is no shame in Christ. See, Christ didn't have a problem with who he was. That's why he could do the job of washing the feet. Because there was no shame. Hello? That's why he could die a criminal's death on the cross. Because there was no shame in him. Watch this. Why did the Apostle Paul, by the reading of the leading of the Holy Spirit, say, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news. Because guess what? People lived in shame. Since Adam and Eve, people lived in shame. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. Is that what the Bible says? God has all honor, all power, all glory. It's all His. And Adam and Eve had the honor and glory of God the Father on them as their His children. Hello? And when they sinned, they were ashamed. Why did they cover up their intimate parts? Because they were ashamed. When they were hiding from God... They weren't hiding, thinking God was going to pound them. They weren't hiding behind the bush, saying, I hope he can't find me. What it means is, is that they could no longer look at God. They were ashamed, and it's like this. It's like when you correct your children. My granddaughter, Olivia, almost three. She can go to act up in my house. She stays in my house about five days a week as my wife takes care of her while my daughter works. So when she's there, sometimes she does things that are not proper. And all I do is say, all I do is say, <clears throat> Olivia, do we do that in this house? That's all I say. And Olivia will do this and go and, and do this. Why? Because... Shame. But we've made the gospel about guilt, not about shame. We try to guilt people to make them better. 
rather than restoring the honor that God did. That's why he said, to them gave he the right, the privilege, the authority, the power, the exousia to become the sons of God. In other words, they have been restored. You and I have been restored to all honor in the image of God. And therefore, we can love as Christ loved. So we can serve as he served. Because there's no shame in serving. I read an article in the paper about one of the, the, the women here that's in the beauty contest. And it talked about how she was not ashamed of being a housekeeper. That she was raised to be somebody's housekeeper. And I thought, wow. How great is that? Most people that would seem to be a housekeeper would be ashamed of their past. Would be seen as less than. But you and I as children of God, it does not matter. Watch this. It does not matter the pasture that God has placed us in. There is no shame if he's placed us there. And we're to serve him Are you following me? As he served us. And we do that by serving others. You and I have a gate. Anybody remember the pastor said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God? That's a gate. That's a gate. Most of us see the doorkeeper as the less than. I I stay in the New Horizon hotels. They want to open the door for me every time I go in. It's like they, they, they run to open the door. It's like, I can open a door. I don't need you to open my door. But they take seriously their job. But the, the reality is for most of us, we don't see that as a very important job. We see it as a less than job. Yes? Except every one of us have been called to be that. Every one of us have an assignment to be the gatekeeper. Gates are important. Gates. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk for about 10 more minutes, then we're going to take a quick break. Gates and gateways are a big deal. So let me tell you about some of the gates that you and I need to be standing in. If we go back to the list of what gates do, if you can back that up to what gates do, a pathway to safety, a place of meeting. I want you to no longer think about the natural. And I want you to think about the spiritual for a moment. Okay? There are all kinds of gateways in the spirit realm. One of the greatest gateways in the spiritual realm is music. The media and music and entertainment industries in our nations, our nations, has the greatest amount of influence. How many of you ladies look at the billboards 
and see those beautiful women up there and try to compare yourself with them and how, boy, if I could just look like that or if I could wear those clothes or if I could wear those shoes. All you men looking at me like, yeah, get on the ladies. Well, how about you looking at those same billboards and go, if my wife looked just like that. It's a gateway. It influences. And we have a responsibility to stand in the gate in the entertainment industry, in the media industry. I heard of a church recently here in the Philippines, in Metro Manila, that their Christian school outside was having music played that was extremely inappropriate. The words, everything about it was inappropriate, ungodly, and they were dancing to that music at the Christian school in recess time in Metro Manila. That's a gate. That's a gate. IBC, you guys live stream, social media. You have a school. You have influence. Those are gates. And what you allow, what you allow to come through the gates will impact the transformation of lives, good or bad. Let me say it again. You're a gate. What you allow will impact good or bad lives. It will impact. Whatever comes through the gate will impact. Write that down. Whatever comes through the gate will impact. The question is, what will you allow to come through your gate? What will you allow to come through your gate? Fathers, mothers in your home, what do you allow to come in the gate of your home? What games? What TV? What music? What actions? What attitudes? What habits do you allow to come through the gate of your home? By the way, this is a free nation. And you have the right, the privilege, and the authority as a Filipino to vote in elections. To be part of elections in this land. How you vote opens the gates in the spirit realm to what comes into this nation. What, how you vote opens in the spirit realm what comes into this nation. When you put somebody in authority, I don't care if it's a barangay captain, they, you have set your right, your authority on their life, and they now open the gates to your barangay. And what they allow in is a direct result of what you stand for in your gate. See, I believe for a child of God to be placed in a nation that allows for free elections and for them not to vote and participate in the government things, we are sinning. For him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. And you have been given the gates and the gateway to a nation. And you are to stand in the gate of this nation by your actions when you vote. Mm, It's real quiet in here. So if you're not registered to vote, go register. You have a gate. And you have a responsibility to guard the gate of your nation. As a child of God, you should protect the gate of your nation. 
Our nation is in trouble called the United States of America. It's in trouble because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ failed to stand in the gate. They failed to be the gatekeeper of our nation. Our nation was founded on biblical principles. Our nation was founded on the laws of God. And we as a nation, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the nation, have failed and been silent and been casual in our living. And our nation is crumbling. I just left. I just left. And the 39th state has now been approved for homosexual marriage. 39 out of 50 people can be married in that are homosexual. Male, male, female, female, you can be married. Hello. And that's, listen to me, that's not the homosexual's fault. That's not the president's fault. That's not the Congress's fault. That's not the state. Listen, that's not the judicial system's fault. It's the church's fault because the church refused to stand up and say no by their voting. Because we did not stand and keep our gates closed. To the things of the enemy. Your nation's well on the way. I have a very vested interest in the Philippines. I've been coming since 99. I read at least three times a week the news of what's going on in the Philippines, even when I'm not here. And I'm watching your nation that used to be about 10 or 15 years behind what was happening in America accelerating extremely fast to walking almost in step with what's happening in America the favor of God came off of our nation America his judgment began against our nation when the church decided to let the gates be opened and live casually. When the church decided to let the gates be opened and live casually. In the 19, coming out of the Great Depression into the 1940s, and they started the Great Society where they allowed government to become the father to the people. And to take over the provision for the people. And to make sure that the people had what they needed. And the people became more concerned about I want and the greener pasture. I'm talking about the church. Became more interested in I want. And they went to the government to be their provider instead of to Jehovah Jireh who is the provider. And in that process, in that process, gave away, opened the gate and said to the government, have your way. Just don't touch our money. And the government decided to control the church very simply where taxes are concerned. And they used money to control the church. Because here's what they did. They said to the pastors. They started the great society. And they said that everybody had to give to social security. I'm talking about the gates being opened. I'm talking about the seriousness of the gates. And the gates opened up. And they started talking about it. And listen to me. Listen. And here's what they said to the church. Everybody has to give to Social Security because you need to pay into that because when you're old, we want to make sure you have something to live on. But to the pastors, because we believe in the separation of church and state, you pastors, you're exempted from Social Security if you want to. All you have to do as a pastor is take a vow of poverty. You take a vow of poverty, fill out this form, 
and you don't have to pay. That's 15.65% of your income, pastor. You don't have to give to the government. And so the pastor said, oh, good. They instituted the taxes and they went to the place and they said this about the taxes. We're going to take, watch this, the payroll taxes from your paycheck. You don't have to write it. We're going to, your companies are going to take it from you and they're going to send it to the government so you don't have to. We're going to make it easy. And oh, by the way, pastors, part of your salary can be housing allowance and you don't have to pay taxes on that part that was given for you to live by. And you don't have to pay Social Security and you don't have to do that. And you don't have to pay income tax. And most pastors are paid so little that everything they get could be used as housing. And so that pastors were exempted from the taxes, Social Security, and they were exempted from here. And guess what? It caused the pastors to be silent because they didn't want to give up that privilege of not paying taxes. And the government took control of the churches by saying to the members of the church, listen, we think you should give money to your church and your church should operate. And we think you should do your tithes and your offerings. We think you should help the poor. We think all of that. And because we're generous to you as a government, anything you give to this charitable, organ charitable organization, you can take off of your income taxes up to... 35% of your income can be given away and you don't have to pay taxes on it. And the church got real quiet about coming against what the politicians were doing. And we let the gate stay open to our nation and we didn't say anything to our nation because here's what else the government said in a little portion of that tax exempt thing. They said this, if you stand in your pulpit and you speak against the politicians and you make a judgment against and you side and you bring politics into the pulpit, you can lose your tax exempt status and you can no longer give credit to your people and the money they give to you, they cannot take off their taxes. And so pastors got afraid and began to where they would not speak against or hold the government accountable. Because they opened the gates. And that started in the 40s. And today, the church is powerless in the nation. And because the church opened the gates and gave up its right, its privilege, its authority, God-given right, privilege, and authority. Because the church gave it up, listen to me, because the church gave it up, three percent, actually it's about four percent now, of the population in the United States has changed the definition of marriage. About 4% of the population of the United States is homosexual. And the whole definition of marriage is being changed in a nation. Because of 4% of the population. And it's all because the church opened the gate and failed to be the gatekeeper. Church, listen to me. Protecting the gates of your city, of your family, of your schools. Are you listening to me? Your school, I can walk into your schools, your public schools. I can walk into your public schools currently and I can share the gospel of the kingdom of God and be received. I cannot do that in America. In America, I have teachers in my church 
that if they open their mouths about the gospel and Jesus Christ, they will be fired. Because we left the gates open to our schools. Gates are so important, and the spiritual gates are so important. But as long as you are selfish, as long as you live, the Lord is my shepherd, he's God, I shall want. As long as it's all about what you want, you leave the gate open. What's happening in your home? What's happening in your neighborhood? What's in your barangay? What's going on in your barangay? Are you informed about what's happening? Do you know what's taking place? You are to stand in the gate. You've been placed in that place. That is your green pasture. Hello? I'm watching the Philippines moving very fast down a road because the gates along the way are standing wide open. Your gates are standing wide open like our gates were standing wide open. And I'm watching this truck come down the road that's going to destroy what was a great thing in your nation quickly. If you don't rise up, church, and stand in the gate. What say you? You with me? You get it? Do you see what I'm talking about? Can you see how your nation is in trouble because we've been casual and we've not been standing in our gates? Do you know why this is open to more than pastors? Because the pastors don't stand in your gate. The pastors have their gate. And they've not done a good job in their gate. But you have your gate. Where are you standing? You with me? Any questions about what I've been saying? I want to make sure you understand the seriousness of this. Any questions? No? I know I went a little longer than what I intended this morning with the first session, but I cannot break that. I can't stop in the middle of what I've been teaching. We're going to have lunch about 12. It's 11 o'clock now. I want to do this. I want to take, a, seriously, I only want to take about a 10 or 15 minute break just to let you stretch your legs, get some coffee or something. I'm going to come back and teach one session before we eat. It'll take me about 45 minutes in that session. The clock here says that it is uh, 5 after 11. By this clock at 11.20, I want to be teaching again. That's 15 minutes. Then I'm going to teach for about 45 minutes and then we'll do lunch, okay? Thank you. God bless.